Good morning and welcome once again to the Church of St Mary's in Sandersted for our service of Holy Communion on this, the third Sunday of Lent. We're going to begin our worship together with the first hymn, Let All the World. in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Grace, mercy and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Together we pray. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Wash me thoroughly from my wickedness, and cleanse me from my sin. Lord, have mercy. Make me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Christ, have mercy. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Lord, have mercy. The sacrifice of God is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart God will not despise. So let us come to the Lord who is full of compassion and acknowledge our transgressions in penitence and faith. Most merciful God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we confess that we have sinned in thought, word and deed. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbours as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been. Help us to amend what we are and direct what we shall be, that we may do justly, love mercy and walk humbly with you, our God. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in life eternal, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And so the collect for the third Sunday of Lent. Almighty God, whose most dear Son went up not to joy, but first he suffered pain, and entered not into glory before he was crucified. Mercifully grant that we, walking in the way of the cross, may find it none other than the way of life and peace. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Luke is now going to bring us our readings. A reading from Exodus, chapter 20, beginning at verse 1. Then God spoke all these words. 
I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above, or that is on the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing children for the iniquity of parents to the third and the fourth generation of those who reject me, but showing steadfast love to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labour and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work, you, your son or your daughter, your male or female slave, your livestock or the alien resident in your towns. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, but rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and consecrated it. Honour your father and your mother, so that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbour. You shall not cover your neighbour's house. You shall not covet your neighbour's wife or male or female slave or ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbour. Today's psalm is psalm number 19. The heavens are telling the glory of God, and the firmament proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours forth speech, and night to night declares knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words, their voice is not heard. Yet their voice goes out through all the earth, and their words to the ends of the world. In the heavens he has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom from his wedding canopy, and like a strong man runs its course with joy. Its rising is from the end of the heavens, and its circuit to the end of them, and nothing is hid from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The decrees of the Lord are sure, making them wise, simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is clear, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. But who can detect their errors? Clear me from hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from the insolent. Do not let them have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. A reading from Paul's letter to the Ephesians, chapter 4, beginning at verse 1. As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope 
when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. So, I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord, that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do, in the futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity, and they are full of greed. That, however, is not the way of life you learned when you heard about Christ and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You were taught with regard to your former way of life, to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Glory to you, O Lord. The Passover of the Jews was near. Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found people selling cattle, sheep and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered what was written. Zeal for your house will consume me. 
The Jews then said to him, What sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. They then said, This temple has been under construction for 46 years, and you say you will raise it up in three days. But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered what he had said, and they believed the scriptures and the words that Jesus had spoken. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable to you, O God, our rock and our redeemer. We're told that when the Israelites left Egypt under Moses, they carried with them the wealth of Egypt. In all, it's estimated that there were about 600,000 men over the age of 20 who left in the Exodus. We're told that in the wilderness, Moses was instructed by God to build a tabernacle or a tent to serve as the house of the Lord and to place in it the Ark of the Covenant, the gold box that contained the Ten Commandments. The tabernacle, which we read about in Exodus 40, wasn't that big at all. It was about four and a half by 13 metres. It was the place where God met with Moses, but to pay for it, we're told that the Israelites gave free will offerings amounting to one tonne of gold and three and three quarter tonnes of silver, worth about 68 million today. I guess God deems his temples to be of value. Jump 480 years later and the tabernacle is gone. Instead, the temple of Solomon has been built to house the ark. It took 180,000 people seven and a half years to build. Its holy vessels of gold and silver would, at today's precious metal prices, be worth 56 billion. And in addition to this, the most holy place and the holy of holies where the ark of the covenant sat was covered inside and out with pure gold. 540,000 ounces, to be precise, worth another 270 million. In short, there was no place on earth then or now as costly. And in the book of Chronicles we read that when Solomon had finished praying, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the glory of the Lord filled the house. As we leave the book of Exodus, where everyone is experiencing the presence of the Lord, we move to Leviticus, where it is only the priests. What's happened? What's gone wrong? Over and over again, the Israelites prove their determination to continue in idolatrous worship. And the presence of God leaves. And all the wealth of Solomon's great temple is plundered by Pharaoh Shishak. I guess the Egyptians got their gold back. While we, of course, have the luxury of being able to turn over a few books and see that God's presence will again be poured out upon all and not just the priests fulfilling Joel's prophecy, I imagine those at the time were left thinking, when? When is all of this going to happen? When are we going to experience God presence again. Almost a thousand years after Solomon comes Herod the Great, he is not a nice man at all. Not only did he kill the babies of Bethlehem, but also his wife and three of his sons. But in order to gain favour with the Jews, he builds bigger than Solomon, and the temple compound goes from 17 to 34 acres, the place we call Temple Mount in Jerusalem today. It's in this where Jesus' anger is let loose. But just 37 years later, Jerusalem is plundered yet again, this time by Titus. A million Jews are murdered, and while there's not nearly the same amount of treasure as there was in Solomon's temple, according to Josephus, a Jewish historian of the time, the flames within the compound were so intense that it melted the gold and the silver of the temple itself, causing it to run between the cracks of the stone blocks, which the Roman soldiers then dismantled stone by stone to get at. It is this precious metal that paid for the Colosseum. Maybe in those moments, those who were left 
remembered Jesus' words as he left the temple, that not one of these stones will remain upon another. And to this day in Jerusalem, you can still see them piled up. One of the things that's characterised our lives over the last year has been the necessity to wear masks when in public and to constantly wash our hands. And so the hands, space, face, strap line has pretty much become part of who we are. We are, I'm sure, physically cleaner than ever. But what about our souls? I had a new cooker delivered on Thursday, and in preparation I spotlessly cleaned the kitchen. It's never looked so clean. The cooker arrived, brought by the delivery guys who wore masks, and when they came in, I asked them if they would take off their shoes. After all, I had bleached the kitchen floor. I then pulled out the old cooker which they were taking away, but what I saw didn't reflect the rest of the kitchen. Out of view, where no one could see, were oil stains on the floor, bits of old food that had dropped down the back and the sides, and even mouse droppings, all just inches away from the very thing that had fed me. Well, mine's not like that, I can hear you say. Well, I didn't think mine was either, until I pulled it out. The delivery men didn't seem that bothered at all, maybe they had seen worse, but I was embarrassed by the filth, and so I set to cleaning it before I moved the new cooker into its space. As I thought about today's reading, I thought about Jesus' outburst, which I think for the most part we find shocking. After all, isn't Jesus supposed to be meek and mild? And I thought about the beauty and value of God's house, the temple, and the cooker in mind. The delivery men weren't bothered. I was embarrassed. Jesus was angry, not at my cooker, but the priests who weren't bothered nor embarrassed about what was present in God's house. They had allowed unpleasant things to gain a footing in his beautiful, holy temple, the place called his dwelling on earth. So long as the cooker looked good, who cares what's underneath seems to be their attitude. You see, in order to gain entry into the temple, you had to pay the temple tax. Being God's house, you couldn't use defiled Roman money. You had to use temple money because that was clean. But here comes the sting, the mould under the cooker, if you like. The exchange rate, all at the cost of the worshipper and to the priest's advantage. You couldn't bring for sacrifice what was deemed an unclean animal after all. God deserves the best. Yet after viewing and then declining your animal, the temple would always buy it off you at a reduced price and sell you one of theirs. Quite possibly, though, it was the one they had rejected from the person before you. Again, bits of mould, stains and droppings behind the golden cooker. My house shall be a house of prayer. You have turned it into a den of thieves. To be frank, it doesn't matter how much gold and silver you use. No one wants a gilded turd. In our second reading, we heard again Paul's words to the Corinthians. Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in your midst? I've had a really tough week and at times I have not felt nor have I acted very holy at all. And so as I was thinking about what to share, I asked myself some questions in light of our reading, and maybe you will do the same. We read that out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. So I asked myself, what is it that is lurking behind my spiritual cooker that needs raking out? What bits of my unholy but gilded self-life have I been content to live with? When we move our cookers out, we discover all manner of things behind them that in many cases we were probably unaware of at the time, although not all. And of course, it's so much easier to pretend that it's not there. After all, who's going to know? Every time I go to Jerusalem, I visit the Temple Mount. There is no temple there. Where the Holy of Holies once stood is now a Muslim shrine, the Dome of the Rock. And unless you're a Muslim, you're not allowed to go in nor are you allowed to pray on the mount itself. And to make sure that you obey those rules, there are police that watch to see if your lips are moving in a prayerful manner 
and if they are, you are told to leave. When we think about the Ten Commandments, we can, I guess, feel as if God is like the policeman watching our every move in order to trap us. But that is so not the case. Jews cannot pray on Temple Mount or go anywhere near the foundation stone of the Holy of Holies. But there is a place under Temple Mount itself where, like the Western Wall, they may gather to pray. It is for them the nearest you can get to the holiest place on earth because of its proximity to where God's presence once dwelt. Last week I watched a programme about a woman who, because she was a Roman Catholic and had refused to renounce her faith, was executed. When dead, somebody cut off her hand, which now sits in a glass dome. It is holy, said the woman, who clearly venerated it. What is it, I guess, that deems something as holy? Is it a consecrated life, a sacrificed life, a special place even? Like me, you probably don't feel very holy at times. And this can be something that, rather than draw you into God's presence, just keeps you away. So let's return again to Paul's words and for some encouragement for writing to the Corinthians, who were known to be extremely sexually promiscuous, very liberal in their views and willing to try anything at least once. Paul affirmed, don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple? and that God's spirit dwells in your midst. Paul wasn't writing hopefully, but confidently to Christians who were not only having stuff behind and underneath the cooker, their filth was all over the kitchen floor. Friends, we are a work in progress, and Jesus fulfilled the law so that we can live according to grace. Our cathedrals are wonderful. The Vatican is beautiful. Our churches here at St. Mary's and St. James are places we love and congregate for worship. We care about them and we spend a great deal of money on them. But they are not God's temples. They are not where he lives. You are. We are. God desires to live in and make us his home. People who love and obey him. People who are holy not for what they have done, but because they have been and remain in his presence. The soil that Moses stood upon didn't pray. It didn't do anything except be in the presence of God, and yet to stand upon it, Moses took off his shoes. And that's why Jesus gets angry. It's when the holy is profaned. It's when those who are made in the image of God, called to be brothers and sisters of Jesus, turn aside from and are turned aside from their consecrated and holy callings. Jesus said, if anybody loves me, they will obey my teaching. My Father will love them and will come to them and make their home, our home with them. I wouldn't have wanted to eat my dinner on the floor behind my cooker. And God is unhappy living in a dirty tent. When we place our faith in Jesus, he inhabits our body, our soul, our spirit. We are his. We can't anymore say, it's my life, my body, I can do with it what I please, although we often do. But let's not beat ourselves up because this has been the experience of Christians right from the very beginning and why Paul had to remind the Corinthians, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God. You are not your own, for you were bought at a price. A man travelling in Paris bought a rather inexpensive amber necklace in a trinket shop. Upon returning home, he was curious as to its value, and so took it to the jeweller. After looking at the necklace under magnifying glass, the jeweller said, I'll give you 25000 for it. The man was so surprised that he decided to have another expert look at it, who offered 10,000 more. What is it that you see that is so valuable? Why don't you look through the glass, replied the Jew. And there before his eyes was the inscription to Josephine from Napoleon. The value came in its association with a person. 
What makes us holy isn't who or what we are, but our association with the Holy One. In the forests of northern Europe and Asia lives the ermine, known for their snow-white fur in winter and what royalty use on their robes. This little animal instinctively protects its white coat against anything that will make it dirty. Fur hunters take advantage of this unusual trait and so don't set a snare to catch them. Instead, they find their home, which is usually in a cleft of a rock or a hollow in a tree, and they smear the entrance and interior with dirt. Then the hunters set their dogs loose to find and chase the ermine. The frightened animal flees towards home, but it doesn't enter because of the filth. Rather than soil its beautiful white coat, they are trapped by the dogs and captured while preserving their purity. For ermine, purity is more precious than life. Jesus was angry with what people had done to God's house. They had made it dirty. The trouble is we know that we can never be pure enough, good enough, or acceptable enough to a holy God, and we hate to be reminded of it so much that we choose not to pull out our cooker. It's the same reason why many people choose not to have therapy. We fear opening a can of worms. We fear it because we have a horrifying terror of being excluded. Will God turn me away? Will I go to hell? There are two reactions to such a fear. One is to crack down upon those who violate the rules. And the other is to get rid of what evaluates us and holds us accountable. I think that's why the church is so often called judgmental. And let's be honest, sometimes it really is. And why so many choose not to come here. It's why we spring clean. It's because the light shows up the dirt. When we stay in the presence of the Lord for any length of time, his light begins to peep behind our cookers, and that can be uncomfortable. I guess living a Christian life can at times feel a lot of no's. An invitation, if you like, to fail before you even begin. And let's not deceive ourselves. Being a Christian does mean sacrifice. It does mean saying no at times. As disciples of Jesus, we are called to live a life worthy of the calling we have received, which at times means laying aside those things that God says are not good for us. But like naughty children, we disagree, we rebel and we do our own thing, and so more food falls behind the cooker. But here's the good news. God doesn't give up on us, nor does he just give us a mop and tell us to clean up our life or else. He gets on his knees and he cleans with us using his own blood and body as the cleaner. On this third Sunday of Lent 2021, the motto of hands, space, face continues to be a physical reality for us. So what then of a spiritual reality? Will we offer our hands up to the Lord, giving him space to look behind our old cookers, to clean and make right those areas that are not pleasing to him, and in so doing, live in the good of being holy, for that's what we are. Not because of our own righteousness, but because we have seen his face. Amen.
So we say together the words of the Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, your presence is known in the structures that we build and also in their collapse. Though your people need places to gather, it is not the buildings or works of art alone that form your legacy. So please fill us with the desire to search for your truth, that by your spirit we may transform the world. Establish in us a community of hope, not to contain your mystery but to be led beyond security into your sacred space. Lord, teach us to live simply, that others might simply live. In your mercy, hear our prayer. Creator God, yearning and striving to bring harmony out of chaos, so fill every fibre of our beings with your wisdom, and so blow as a mighty rushing wind among the landscapes of our world the earth may reflect the wonder of the universe in the glory of the transfigured Christ who shared with you in the cost of creation. Lord, teach us to live simply, that others might simply live. In your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we thank you for the gift of friendship, for our companions on the journey with light enough to show us the fruit where brambles grow and warmth enough to feed the grain of daily need. For those who in times of adversity welcome us in and shut the door on the wolves outside, and for those who in times of happiness share a double joy where each is glad for both. Lord, help us to treasure such relationships and through them grow ever closer to you. Lord, teach us to live simply that others might simply live. In your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, you bind up the brokenhearted and you proclaim freedom to the captive, promising justice to all who mourn its absence or loss. Please look with compassion on those who suffer. Bless them with beauty instead of ashes, the oil of gladness in place of grief and instead of a cloak of despair, enfold them in a garment of unending praise. And in a time of quietness, we name before God those who need a touch of his grace and his healing at this time.
Lord, teach us to live simply, that others might simply live. In your mercy, hear our prayer. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, who has given us access to his grace. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation. Through your goodness we have this bread to set before you which earth has given and human hands have made. May it be for us the bread of life. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation. Through your goodness we have this wine to set before you, fruit of the vine and work of human hands. It will become for us the cup of salvation. Blessed be God. The Lord is here. His spirit is with us. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. It is indeed right and good to give you thanks and praise, almighty God and everlasting Father, through Jesus Christ your Son. For in these 40 days you lead us into the desert of repentance that through a pilgrimage of prayer and discipline we may grow in grace and learn to be your people once again. Through fasting, prayer and acts of service, you bring us back to your generous heart. Through study of your holy word, you open our eyes to your presence in the world. and You free our hands to welcome others into the radiant splendour of your love. As we prepare to celebrate the Easter feast with joyful hearts and minds, we bless you for your mercy, and we join with the saints and angels for ever praising you and saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Accept our praises, Heavenly Father, through your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. And as we follow his example and obey his command, grant that by the power of your Holy Spirit, these gifts of bread and wine may be to us his body and his blood. Who in the same night that he was betrayed, took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and gave you thanks. He gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, 
which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Therefore, Heavenly Father, we remember his offering of himself made once for all upon the cross. We proclaim his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension. We look for the coming of your kingdom and with this bread and this cup, we make the memorial of Christ, your son, our Lord. Great is the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Accept through him our great high priest, this our sacrifice of thanks and praise. And as we eat and drink these holy gifts in the presence of your divine majesty, renew us by your spirit, inspire us with your love, and unite us in the body of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, through Christ and with Christ and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, with all who stand before you in earth and heaven, we worship you, Father Almighty, in songs of everlasting praise. Blessing and honour and glory and power be yours for ever and ever. Amen. And so as our Saviour has taught us, so we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Grant us peace.
Let us pray. Merciful Lord, grant your people grace to withstand the temptations of the world, the flesh and the devil, and with pure hearts and minds to follow you, the only God, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Almighty God, we thank you for feeding us with the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him we offer you our souls and bodies to be a living sacrifice. Send us out in the power of your Spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen. There is uh, an important notice last week at the end of the service there was some dates regarding the Easter service on your screen unfortunately these have had to be revised because of the government regulations concerning the use of choirs in church and unfortunately um, it looks as if we will not be able to have uh, a choir at St Mary's and so Maundy Thursday um, and Easter Sunday will now be services on YouTube so that we can incorporate music into those wonderful services. But Good Friday, um, we'll still have a service of Messy Church at St Edmund's at 11am and at 1.30 we will still have the Stations of the Cross and said Liturgy of the Day here at St Mary's and that's at 1.30. Those um, details are now coming up on your screen and if you can of course help me with messy church by all means please drop me an email or a text to let me know that you are available to help we're going to bring our service to a close with our final hymn all people that on earth do dwell Christ give you grace to grow in holiness, to deny yourselves, take up your cross and follow him. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you and those you love always. 
Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen.